So welcome to everybody who's joining us at home and we're going to begin with the opening prayer and then we'll join in the confession which is in the, on the third sheet in the black and white service booklets. Heavenly Father, we do thank you that we can meet together in your presence to worship you, to, um, to pray to you, to bring before you the needs of the world and those on our hearts, and to hear and respond to your word, and of course to remember the death of our Lord Jesus uh, for us. Part in the hearts as we pray now our confession on the top of the page. So we say together, Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we have sinned against you and against our neighbour in thought and word and deed, through negligence, through weakness, through our own deliberate fault. We are truly sorry and repent of all our sins. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, who died for us, forgive us all that is past, and grant that we may serve you in newness of life, to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, who forgives all who truly repent, have mercy upon you, pardon and deliver you from all your sins, confirm and strengthen you in all goodness, and keep you in life eternal, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Our reading this morning is from Mark chapter 4, verses 1 to 20. And you can find it in the Blue Pew Bibles on page one thousand and. Five. Mark 4, 1 to 20. Again, Jesus began to teach by the lake. The crowd that gathered round him was so large that he got into a boat and sat in it out on the lake, while all the people were along the shore at the water's edge. He taught them many things by parables, and in his teaching said, Listen, a farmer went out to sow his seed. As he was scattering the seed, some fell along the path, and the birds came and ate it up. Some fell on rocky places, where it did not have much soil. It sprang up quickly, because the soil was shallow. But when the sun came up, the plants were scorched, and they withered, because they had no root. Other seed fell among thorns, which grew up and choked the plants, so that they did not bear grain. Still other seed fell on good soil. It grew up, came up, grew, and produced a crop, multiplying thirty, sixty, or even a hundred times. Then Jesus said, He who has ears to hear, let him hear. When he was alone, the twelve and the others around him asked him about the parables. He told them, the secret of the kingdom of God has been given to you. But to those on the outside, everything is said in parables, so that they may be ever seeing but never perceiving, and ever hearing but never understanding. Otherwise, they might turn and be forgiven. Then Jesus said to them, Don't you understand this parable? How then will you understand any parable? The farmer sows the word. Some people are like seed along the path, where the word is sown. As soon as they hear it, Satan comes and takes away the word that was sown in them. Others, like seed sown on rocky places, hear the word and at once receive it with joy. But since they have no root, they last only a short time. 
when trouble or persecution comes because of the word, they quickly fall away. Still others, like seeds sown among thorns, hear the word. But the worries of this life, the deceitfulness of wealth, and the desires for other things, come in and choke the word, making it unfruitful. Others, like seeds sown on good soil, hear the word, accept it, and produce a crop, thirty, sixty, or even a hundred times, what was so. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We pray that you would speak to us through it this morning by your spirit and help us to receive it with attentive hearts. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. So this is a very familiar story that Jesus told, the parable of the sower, and it's one of a number that we'll be looking at through these weeks leading up to Easter. It's a story that many of us can relate to if we are perhaps green-fingered, maybe we have a garden or a, a pot plant on a windowsill, or we've seen others uh, with such things. We know sometimes plants grow, sometimes they don't grow, and sometimes they grow for a little bit and then they die. In my house, pot plants tend to just die, but that I'm not green-fingered, some of you may well be. But this is a story about a farmer who distributes the seed extravagantly, profligately, and indiscriminately. He throws the seed almost everywhere that you can imagine. Some lands on the path, and uh, that's very hard soil, a little like throwing it onto a road where the cars might drive past it, where it has no chance of growing. Some seed is thrown into shallow, rocky soil. We might think today of throwing it onto a patio. It might spring up briefly, but it can't put down a root, and so it lasts a short time. Some seed is thrown among thorns. We might think of throwing seed into a hedgerow. And there isn't room for it to grow. So it gets swiftly overwhelmed and can't flourish. But lastly, there is so seed that lands on the good soil, takes root and produces a harvest. So perhaps the first question we might ask is, well, what is this parable really all about. And it's a story about how we respond to God's word. And we know that because Jesus tells us so. If we look on to chapter 4, verse 14, Jesus says, the farmer sows the word. So There's no doubt as to what this story is about. Of course, when Jesus spoke, there were huge crowds that gathered to hear him. And the disciples may well have wondered, why is it that as they move from town to town and people hear the wonderful teaching of Jesus, that so many just vanish away or lose heart or don't stay the course? We would expect everybody hearing Jesus to respond favourably. But it doesn't seem to be the case. And in our own experience, we also know that there are many and varied responses to the Word of God, to the Scriptures. We've seen them in our own experience. Some hear and forget. Some hear and respond for a short time. Um, and some hear and last. So the seed that falls on the path, Jesus says it's as if Satan steals the message out of people's minds. This is where somebody just doesn't seem to listen at all. The teaching of Jesus goes in one ear and out the other. It's like water off a duck's back. Most preachers have had the experience of preaching a sermon and being aware that some are listening, but others, their minds seem to be a hundred miles away. Their eyes are glazed. Perhaps I think about Sunday lunch or 
a walk in the countryside or, or, or who knows? I never quite know um, what's going through people's minds. But we, we know how easy it is for people to just ignore the word of God. It's like a seed on the path. It makes no impact at all. And then others are like the seed on the rocky, shallow soil. They're enthusiastic for a brief time. Perhaps the disciples saw this in the crowds that followed Jesus, that where there may be some who just couldn't stop talking about how wonderful Jesus was and shouting out Hosanna, perhaps, or being enthusiastic. They give it a day or a week and they've just vanished away. And it's a common experience in almost all church congregations that people come for a while and they are so enthusiastic, perhaps for a day or a week, even a few years. And then they've gone from being 100% enthusiastic to nothing at all. They're not, not, they know that longer then. We wonder what's happened to them, where have they gone? It's not they're ill, they haven't always moved away. Sometimes they, they just can't be bothered anymore. Church was a, a passing enthusiasm, and then it passes. And now they've taken up baking or skateboarding or, or bingo. And then there is the seed among the thorns, so easily choked. And this Jesus says, is where people lose heart because they're crushed by life's distractions and worries and concerns. And we know so easily how this can happen. We come to church, we read our Bibles, we pray, but then life gets so busy. The demands of work are irresistible. Perhaps ill health creeps in, or financial worry, and we just can't hold on to our joy. And so people just drift away. We see it so frequently. And then there is the glorious final example of, of the seed that's sown, where it really makes a difference. It produces a crop. We see that in the twelve, or most of them, not all. And we see it in our own church fellowship, as people's lives are touched by the mercy and grace of God, as they grow in their faith and they persist in trusting the Lord Jesus and we rejoice with them in their faithfulness. It's a simple enough story, but we might ask, well, what does it have to do with us? Well, firstly, I think Jesus tells the parable in order to guard the disciples against disappointment or disillusionment or unrealistic expectations. We might assume that anyone who hears the word of God will be changed and transformed by it. But it's so important, isn't it, that we remember what Jesus says here. It seems like three out of four people will not stay the course. And some won't listen and others will just fall by the wayside. And for us, of course, it's discouraging, isn't it? If someone comes to church and they don't seem to listen or pay attention. And it's heartbreaking if someone comes for a few months or a year and then just gives up as if their faith meant nothing to them. And we feel for those who, who give up because life is hard. But if that was true of Jesus' ministry, then we shouldn't be surprised if it still happens today. And we shouldn't lose heart because of it. So it's a parable that guards us against discouragement of disillusionment. George, maybe you might want to sit quietly during the sermon. That'd be brilliant. It's also a, par a parable that's designed to encourage us, I think, to give us hope. Because there is that fourth soil where the word really makes a difference. 
And for all of those who ignore it, or disregard it, or, or reject it, or give up, there are those for whom the grace of God is truly life-changing. God is a rock, and we can hold on to the power of his word uh, to change lives. But of course, and you're probably ahead of me here, the most important uh, application of the parable to us is to challenge us to ask, well, how do we personally respond to God's word? What sort of soil are we? What place does the word have in our lives? And perhaps we might take a moment to think about that. Because we don't want to be like the hard soil, like the path, where the word doesn't penetrate, where we don't listen. And the way to avoid being like the path is to choose to be receptive, to hear the word of God, to allow it into our hearts and minds. For some of us, practically, that might mean something as sim simple as getting a hold of a Bible at home. For others, it might be getting the Bible out that we already have and reading it, making time in our busy schedule to do that. And for others of us, it may be that we read it, but we also try and listen to hear what God is saying. We ask, what is God saying to me through these words? So that it doesn't just go over our heads. And secondly, we don't want to be like the shallow soil, where the, the plant springs up but then dies away so quickly. And the issue here is about commitment, isn't it? We want to be those who are committed in our faith right to the end. The RSPCA used to have a, a phrase that a dog is for life, not just for Christmas. Well, that's certainly true of our faith in the Lord Jesus, how much more. Indeed, the most important relationships in our lives are those that are lifelong. Just think of a, a responsible parent's care for their children. How long should parents care for their children's well-being? Well, forever, really. We think it odd if the parents say, well, I'll, I'll, I've lost interest after a month, so I'm not bothered anymore. And if we want to share in the glories of heaven, and receive the promises and blessings of God in eternity, then of course we need our faith to be lifelong, to stay the course, to run the race, to endure and persevere. And so we can say, yes, I'm in this for the long haul. And we don't want to be the soil that is thorny, choked by the weeds. And I think the issue here is trust. We don't want to be fair-weather Christians, but all-weather Christians. To trust God not just when life goes well, but when it's really hard. When it's difficult and stressed and pressured and when the, the sorrows and strains of life weigh down upon us. Then we hold on to God who is faithful, who still loves us, even when it is hard. But most of all, we want to be that good soil where the grace and love and mercy of God reaps a rich harvest in our lives. And we can do that by coming to God with receptive, accepting and trusting hearts. And when we do that, we'll find that God's word is truly life-changing and transformative and produces a harvest in us. So let's pray that we will be good soil, receptive to God's word, open to his spirit working in us through it. Heavenly Father, you know how easy it is in our busy lives to be distracted or stressed or pressured or just not make time to listen to your word. 
Help us to be attentive, humble, teachable. Good soil in which you produce a good harvest. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, in a moment we're going to pray, but before we do so, we're going to sing um, our first song. It's on page 19 in the songbooks, and it's a temporary version of the, of the 23rd Psalm. The Lord's my shepherd, I'll not want. And Julie's going to be accompanying us on the keyboard with the blessing as well. So let's stand.
Well, now let's sit. I'll kneel to pray. come to our prayers. Let's try to be really quiet and focus on God's presence here with us. Heavenly Father, thank you for your life-giving word. Help us to take time to spend reading and reflecting upon it and listening to your voice. Help us to have responsive, humble, teachable hearts and eyes open to see and ears ready to hear. Please help us to have changed hearts and minds and lives, <coughs> touched by your grace and transformed by your loving kindness. Help us to persevere in our faith, to remain committed even when life is hard. And we pray particularly this morning for all those suffering with the adversities of life, with sorrow and sickness, discouragement and despair, bereavement and loneliness. Be close to all those in need. Comfort their hearts and reassure them with your presence. And this morning we particularly pray for all those caught up in the conflict in Ukraine. For soldiers and civilians. For the homeless and the displaced. And those who are far from home. We pray for your help and protection for all of them, and for peace in every way. Peace in our world, peace in our hearts, and most of all, peace with you. And we thank you for Jesus, our wonderful Saviour who has borne our sorrows and walked the path of suffering, who has died in our place and risen so that we can receive forgiveness and new life through faith in him. Almighty God, whose Son, Jesus Christ, fasted 40 days in the wilderness, and was tempted as we are, yet without sin. Give us grace to discipline ourselves in obedience to your Spirit. And as you know our weakness, so may we know your power to save. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Turning to our service booklets to page three, we join together in the communion prayer. The Lord is here, his spirit is with us. Lift up your hearts, we lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give thanks and grace. It is right to praise you, Father, Lord of all creation. In your love you made us to yourself. When we turned away, you did not reject us, but came to meet us in your Son. You embraced us as your children and welcomed us to sit and eat with you. In Christ you shared our life, that we might live in him and he in us. He opened his arms of love upon the cross and made for all the perfect sacrifice for sin. 
On the night he was betrayed at supper with his friends, he took bread and gave you thanks. He broke it and gave it to them, saying, Take it, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Father, we do this in remembrance of him. His body is the bread of life. At the end of supper, taking the cup of wine, he gave you thanks and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in remembrance of me. Father, we do this in remembrance of him. His blood is shed for all. As we proclaim his death and celebrate his rising in glory, send your Holy Spirit that this bread and this wine may be to us the body and blood of your dear Son. As we eat and drink these holy gifts, make us one in Christ, our risen Lord. With your whole church throughout the world, we offer you this sacrifice of prayer and lift our voice to join the eternal song of heaven. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the heights. And as our Saviour taught us, so we pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory of yours, now and forever. Amen. In a moment we'll come to communion and when we do so I'll invite you to come up the centre aisle and then you can receive the bread and the wine if you wish or just the bread and then if you return by the side aisles uh, to your places um, and I'll announce when it's time to come. As we come to communion, we'll fix our minds on Jesus' death for us, and we'll try and keep respectfully quiet as we do so. So do please come forward to receive communion if you'd like to.
Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for Jesus' death on the cross in our place, for the grace and mercy, forgiveness and new life that you offer us as we trust in him. Give us thankful hearts and help us to live each day uh, in the light of your presence and thankful for your great mercies. Amen. Well, we're going to stand to sing our final song of praise and worship this morning. It's in the Orange Hymn Books, number 407. O oh Lord my God, when I in awesome wonder consider all the works thy hands have made. Before we, before we sing that final song, Caroline's just going to say an extra word or two um, for I'm us. so sorry. I got so emotional earlier. I completely forgot to mention. Children who are doing our auction are, are meeting up at Mosley Hive on Tuesday and Thursday. You're also welcome to join. It's between 3.30 and 5 p.m. However, we asked on Facebook and we'll ask um, in this congregation as well for some art supplies. If you have any to spare, Please, could you drop off some to Vicarage this week? Um, so <laughs> Philip very kindly agreed to store it for us. And all these supplies are going to go for children in Hive to create the works for art, for art, of art for us. Um, however, later on, there will be a group organized, art group for children in Mosley. So whatever we don't use uh, is going to stay in Hive for local children. Thank you. Thank you, Caroline. If you're not at all sure about what you can do practically, just have a word with Caroline afterwards and she'll, she'll make it all clear. Thank you. 
And now, may the blessing of Almighty God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, rest on each one of you, now and always. Amen.